and glorify you this morning. Lord, open our ears and our hearts as we listen to the words that you have laid on Jacob's heart to share with us this morning. We thank you for your Holy Spirit and your presence. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, John. Good morning. I want to echo the words of John and just thank all of our visitors who are with us here today. It means so much to us that you've come, that you're here to remind us of our roots and where we've been. Thank you. We're blessed. This picture captured my imagination this past week. It was in an article for the BBC News about a new, I don't know if you want to call it a controversy or a discussion in England about the use of tents by nonprofit organizations and charities giving them out to homeless, or in England, as they call them, rough sleepers. And as I looked at this picture, I thought, what must it be like to be the people walking by this tent, going about their ordinary life, you know, their doctor's appointments, on the way to work, on their way to the bank, and then they see this tent on the street corner, something that's out of place, not where it should be in the normal, in the normal order of things. Or what would it be like to be the person in the tent and always be wondering about your safety, worried about your security or where your next meal is going to come from? What would it, like to, what would it be like to be these people in these situations? As I read the article, I was surprised. Guess what the average lifespan of a rough sleeper is in England? Any, any guesses? 47. 47 years old. It's very, very young. It's a, hard, it's a hard life. And it made me think about the things that are out of place that we see in our lives. This issue is not so far away from us. If we recall just a few years ago on the south end of Worcester at the intersection of 30 and 250, there was a community of homeless living in tents. They called it Tent City. And for a number of years, that was how they subsided. So it kind of makes me wonder... What do we think when we see people in these situations? What do we think when we see these situations in life that seem out of place? I'd like to share with you a specific verse from our passage today that I think is at the heart of the message. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. So I I wonder with you this morning, what does that mean? What is the significance of the Word Becoming flesh. Becoming flesh. Last week we talked about God and his nature as missional. A God who desires for healing to go out to all parts of the world, to all people in the world. And that requires crossing barriers. And so he sends his son to cross this huge barrier between humanity and God. And then the son sends us to cross all these human barriers to get in the way of people connecting with God. God is a missionary God. And this involves crossing barriers. Well, the incarnation crosses a huge barrier. And if you take sermon notes, I want want you to write down this term in your sermon notes today, identification. Identification. Because that is what the, the incarnation is about. Jesus chose to identify with us, to take on flesh, to unite his divine nature with the human nature, to enter into our earthly existence is about identifying with our struggles, our hardships, to know what it's like. And now I want you to write these terms down as well. Proximity and presence. This is about identification, proximity, and presence. When our scripture tells us that he made his dwelling among us, it means that he came close to our ordinary daily lives. And not only was he in the midst of everything we're doing and here on earth doing his ministry work and showing us the way to live, he was present. He was open to have relationship with us. He was present, willing to discuss and to share with us what it's like to live here on the earth. I want to share a picture with you. I saw this this past week and I actually contacted the artist. His name is Jack Baumgartner. And I asked for permission to use this painting. And he said, yes, that would bless me if you use this in your sermon. This is the depiction of the story from John's gospel of the woman who's caught in adultery. 
And the scribes and the Pharisees bring her before Jesus and say, according to the law of Moses, she should be stoned. And we know Jesus' reply. And I just want to take a second here to think about this artist's depiction of that story. So here you have the woman here on the left who's been caught in adultery, her head hung in shame. Here you have one of the scribes or the Pharisees standing there proclaiming judgment. And here's a depiction of Jesus. And in the story we're told, as they're telling him these things, he bends down and he's writing on the ground. Now, commentators for generations have been wondering, what, is, what was he writing and why was he doing that particular action? But I just ask you to look at this picture for a second and think about what Jesus is doing. Think about the words I share with you. Identification, proximity, presence. What is Jesus doing? What is he saying to the woman right now? And what is he saying to the scribe or this Pharisee? What is he saying? I want you to think about it. Why would he bend down? What does that posture signify? What's that? Let's say it one more time. A humbleness. A humbleness. Absolutely. What's that? A servant. A servant. Yes. Non-judge, non-judgmental. Non-threatening. Non-threatening. Yeah, think about the woman. Think how ashamed she must have been to be publicly dragged out. It says she was caught in the act. Okay, that's how they, that's how they discovered her. Think of how ashamed she must have been. She wouldn't even have wanted to look Jesus in the eye. And so what does he do to respond? He kneels down, so he lowers himself, so he's not standing above her. And he writes, he looks down here as he writes. So he's not looking straight into her eyes, but he's pointing somewhere else. And she can stand beside him, and they can talk without it being threatening to her. And what does he say to the scribe or the Pharisee? He says, let the one who is among you without sin cast the first stone. That's his response. Oh, Janine, yes, you notice something very interesting about this picture. She asked about, what is this white thing hanging down, right? Yeah, um, this white thing is interesting. I actually didn't get a full explanation from the artist, but I want you to look a little bit to the right of this figure here. What do you see here in the shadow? Can anybody see that up there? In, in the shadow, it looks like a steeple with a cross on the top. Um, like you're coming up here, and then at the very top, there's a cross, like in the steeple. It's kind of the, the type of architecture you see more in Eastern churches, like a onion, onion dome type of a steeple. Right, it looks like there's a flag coming down. But, but the artist here, what he's saying is sometimes, instead of the pattern of Jesus, with this posture of identifying with the person who's struggling and not being threatening but coming alongside them, sometimes instead of that posture, the church has the posture of the scribe or the Pharisee where we articulate the moral law, we tell the person what is right and wrong, but we do it from afar. We stand and make our pronouncement from afar. And I, and I want to share a quote from Michael Frost about this. He says, and this is really important, We cannot demonstrate Christ-likeness at a distance. We cannot demonstrate Christ-likeness at a distance from those who we feel called to serve. We can't do it like this. We're not going to be successful at changing their hearts or communicating God's love to them. So if we're called to identify with, draw close to, and be present to those who were struggling. Now, what did they call Jesus in Matthew's gospel because he was this way? What did they call him? Matthew chapter 11, verse 19. They called him a friend of sinners, of tax collectors and sinners. And his position was not a popular position to eat with those who were considered sinners. He would eat with them when he ministered to them. They were drawn to him. And it was scandalous to the scribes and Pharisees. Do we remember last week in our passage when he begins his ministry, he read from Luke's In Luke's gospel, he he reads from the scroll in Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim 
good news for the lame, the brokenhearted, the captive, all these groups of people who are out of place, who don't belong in the center of society. And what happens after he delivers that message? Does anybody remember last week? What, what do the people do in response when he proclaims that message? They take him to the edge of the city and they want to push him off a cliff. Because what Jesus is doing here is, is very hard because it challenges our systems, it challenges the way we tend to think and the way things should be in our society. And it makes me think once again, what is it like when we see something out of place in our world? We're going about daily life, doing our normal thing. What is God's heart when we see that person who's out of place? What does he call us to? I want to ask you about another picture here. Can anybody tell me what this building is? That's the old mission. Um, 713 Gashi Street is the address for that building. I don't know how many of you know the story, so I just want to read it real quickly, the story of how our church began, because there's something really important there about identification Proximity and Presence. And I want you to listen to this story. It's written in an article by, let's see here, D.W. Uh, Miller, 1951, the Ohio Mission Evangel, the January-February issue. So listen to these words. In 1936, Rudy Stauffer, then pastor of the Salem Mennonite Church, seven miles northeast of Worcester, felt led to start a work in Worcester. Brother Stauffer and a member of the Salem congregation made a survey in the northeast section of the city. Personal visitation and cottage prayer meetings resulted in an interesting number of people in the gospel. Gladys Muma did personal work among the needy families, and evangelistic meetings were held in, the, in tents for a number of years. C.F. Durstein was the first of the evangelists to serve in this way. A number of com- converts were won through these meetings. Sunday school was started in the home of W.H. Shoup. At first, only a few mats in one room. But later, in 1942, Roland Ross, a member of the mission, purchased a large house on Gashi Street. And services were held there in the afternoon. In 1943, the Ohio Mennonite Mission Board purchased the house from Brother Ross and took over the work of the mission. The work continued to grow, and D.W. Miller and his family moved from Canton to Worcester to take charge of the work on January 1949. Brother Brother Miller Miller was ordained pastor and superintendent of the mission on January 16, 1949. By this time, the membership had increased to 40. So what it's saying basically is Worcester Mennonite Church began with this inspiration from Rudy Stauffer, the sense that something was stirring, something was maybe a calling to do something in Worcester. And so he got together and they started mission outreach work with tent meetings. They started finding ways to draw close to those in Worcester and start something. And this was the really the first established location where the church met, this house on Gashi Street. And after Rudy Stauffer, the, first, the, the next minister to serve was the one writing this article, D.W. Miller. Now, he gives a charge in this article that I want to read to you and just ask you to think about these words and how they still apply to us today. This is what D.W. Miller says at the end of his article. Here is a challenge for all of us. Let's listen to his words. Here is a challenge for all of us. Now, this was written in 1951, all right? Let's think about this. The command of our Lord to witness for him. The profession we make as disciples of Christ. The generation we serve in the lost world about us. Challenge us to be faithful, to evangelize the world. Will we evangelize the cities of our day? Worcester needs the witness of the whole gospel. Worcester, a modern city, needs the witness of the Mennonite church. Will we meet that challenge? Will you pray? Will you work? Will you give? Will you help in this building program as a witness to the grace of God? Let us rise up and build. (laughs) Let us rise up and build. Amen. I, 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 read, I read these words and I thought, you know, this was at the heart of the vision of why we're here today. We need to rediscover and celebrate afresh 
that mission has always been at the heart of Worcester Mennonite congregation. Mission was the reason we're here to begin with, and mission is the heart of our God. Amen. We're sent out. And when we see the, the hurting people in the city of Worcester, when we see those who are out of place, who don't feel like they belong, let's think of our Lord Jesus, who was one who came among us, who himself seemed out of place, who chose to minister even though it wasn't popular with those who were outcasts. Let's remember that calling to the gospel message. And I want to leave these two challenges with you today. These are really important questions. Am I close in proximity to those whom God has called me? So for the first generation, a number of them would have moved here to be close to the community they were serving. Jesus and his model of ministry would draw close by having meals with and fellowship with the tax collectors and the sinners. He was in close proximity. He was present to them. Who are the people in your life that God is calling you to be close with? And sometimes we know it's hard because when we choose to be close with them, other people can judge us. Other people can misunderstand. But I want you to ask yourself this question this week. You can even um, write it in your bulletin and reflect on it later and really pray and ask God this this question for him to reveal to you the answer. Am I close in proximity to those whom God has called me? And then finally, this is really important, if we're going to be present to those God calls us to, do we identify with the fears and concerns of those around us? Do we identify with the fears and concerns? Can we really hear them on a deeper level, what they need, what their heart is? This is a really important part of ministry. You know, we've had this banner up for over a year now, and it's an important reminder of what our church stands for, God's healing and hope flowing through us to the world. God's healing and hope flowing through us to the world. So I invite you with me this morning to give thanks to God for our roots. That missionary vision that led Rudy Stauffer and the initial group to form our church. And I invite you to continue to follow the missional call today. Be willing to cross barriers and identify with those in your life whom God is calling you to serve. Will you please bow your heads with me? Lord Jesus, we just praise your holy name this morning and thank you that you would choose to identify with us and draw close to us. that you would place your tent in our neighborhood. That it meant so much to you that we experience your grace that you would come and suffer for us. I want to thank you this morning, especially for those who have gone before us in this place, for their vision and their passion to honor you, to answer your call to mission. And Lord Jesus, I pray that you would grant us the grace, the empowerment, the vision in this chapter of Worcester Mennonite's life to continue to seek after your mission in Worcester. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear the people who are hurting in our midst. Help us to cross barriers that keep them marginalized from society. Help us to cross barriers that keep them marginalized and isolated from you. Give us all the grace to see who we can reach this week. And we give you thanks again for your abundant salvation and forgiveness in your son, Jesus. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and all God's people said.